quickly. I'm just going to do a little bit of a prayer in Arabic. And this is from the Psalms. It's from Psalms 91. يسقط عن جانبك ألف وربوات عن يمينك إليك لا يقرب إنما بعينيك تنظر وترى مجازات الأشرار لأنك قلت أنت يا رب ملجئي جعلت العلي مسكنك لا يلاقيك, لا يلاقيك شر ولا تدنو ضربة من خيمتك لأنه يوصي ملائكته بك لكي يحفظك في كل طرقك على الأيدي يحملونك لأنك تصدم بحجر رجلك على الأسد والصل والشبل والثعبان تدوس لأنك تعلق بي أنجيه أرفعه لأنه عرف اسمي يدعوني فأستجيب له معه أنا في الضيق أنقذه وأمجده من طول الأيام أشبعه وأريه خلاصة That's Psalms 91, um, 10 to 16 Y'all got that? <laughs> All right. Just a little trigger warning. This following presentation has been approved for every American citizen. Please be advised that this presentation mentions Jesus and God. An allergic reaction may occur. All right. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do, what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? I couldn't think of a better verse to start this. Because my story doesn't start with me. My story starts long before me. My story starts with the generation before me. It starts with my mother and the choices that she made in her life. My mother was born and raised Rum Orthodox. How many people know what Rum Orthodox is? One in the back? That's usually about it. Um, Rum Orthodox is actually one of the oldest sects of the Christian church. It was started by St. Peter and St. Paul himself visited, and, and he helped teach them as well. Um, the reason you haven't heard of the Rum Orthodox is because they were nearly exterminated by the first invasion of the Holy Land by Muslims. Now, um, she met my father. She lived in the Middle East. My mother's actually from Bethlehem. Oh, little cool tidbit. Bethlehem in Arabic. Does anybody know what it means? So in Arabic, it's Bethlehem. Literally means house of the flesh. Pretty cool, huh? Yeah. So um, that's where my mom is from. My dad is from Hebron. My dad is a Muslim. And uh, his family is actually originally Jewish. And the funny thing about the Middle East is that families are not quite as they are here. So, for example, if your last name is Smith and you meet another Smith from, say, North Carolina, it's not likely that you're related. Well, in the Middle East, it's not that way. Your last name, it connects you to a whole clan of people. And, well, with my last name, which is not Prudence, I use that for security reasons, my last name is very Jewish. And when I introduce myself to people, they say, oh, you're the Jews that were too cheap to pay the jizya, so you converted. <laughs> Literally. Seven years old and people would say this to me. And it's because during the first invasion of the Holy Land, my father's family, as my, his father told me, my granddaddy, who was a very sweet man, actually, um, he said... When they invaded the Holy Land, they were given a choice. You either become a Muslim, or you pay the jizya, which is the, the tax, or you die. Well, at first they resisted converting, but then they did to try and save themselves. And in the beginning, it was being a Muslim on the outside and being a Jew on the inside in the home. And then generation after generation, it just got lost and they became Muslims. And this is the story of so many Middle Eastern people. When Islam came in, it wiped away their identities, their mother tongues. It wiped away their culture. It even took, burned down libraries. It even took down statues. Much of what happened in Iraq, if you watched it at all, with ISIS going into Mosul, burning down libraries, destroying priceless artifacts, wiping away cultures, that's been happening for 1,400 years. It's not a new story. So that's where I come from. Those are my parents. Of course, they have the forbidden love story. 
And I can't tell you at every event how many people come up to me, um, how many people email me or message me on Facebook, my niece, my daughter, my sister, my cousin. They're in love with a Muslim man. And we're losing our daughters. We're losing our daughters and nobody's talking about it. So this forbidden love story might sound very familiar to you because every time somebody talks to me, and I'm literally getting goosebumps, every time somebody talks to me, I'm like, hmm, I've lived that story. Same story. Tall, dark, and handsome. Swoops her off her feet. It's so masculine and so macho and so incredibly handsome and promises to show her the world and give her everything she's never had. Well, that's what happened to my mom. They eloped and got married in California. I was born free as an American citizen, blessed by God to be born American, um, in Ohio. And then my mom proceeded to have three more children here. By the time my mom was pregnant with my second sister, the story had changed. It was no longer the love and romance and drawing a Christmas tree inside of a crescent moon, which is a symbol for Islam, or drawing a cross with a crescent moon. My dad actually married my mom in a church too. They got married in a mosque and they got married in a church. Mm -hmm. By the time my mom was pregnant with my second sister, Christ was not allowed in the house. The Bible was not allowed in the house. My mother was not allowed to work. She's not allowed to talk to her family as much as she wanted. They were only allowed to be there for the amount of time that he said they could be there. And this was right here in the States in the late 80s, early 90s. Well, my mom was about nine months pregnant <laughs> with my second sister when my dad said, if you don't convert to Islam, I'm going to take the kids and go back to the Middle East. And you're never going to see your children again. So November 1st of that year, my mom went before a mosque filled with men, and right in front of them, the imam, who's the leader of the mosque, said, do you deny Jesus the Christ? Hmm. Well, I'm going to reassure you that this is not the normal procedure for becoming a Muslim. The normal procedure for becoming a Muslim is simply just saying the shahada, right? I testify there's no God but Allah, and the testimony about Muhammad. So my mother was shocked to be asked this question. And she said there was probably 300 men in that mosque. So he asked her again, do you deny Jesus the Christ? And she just started crying. And the third time, he banged on his table and said, do you deny Jesus the Christ? I can't hear you. And she said, yes. And I believe that was the moment that my story changed. I could have grown up to be a normal American child if my mom had known her rights, if she had known that there was help here for her to get, if there was a church that was available to help her, but she was desperate and she trusted what he said. She believed him because she knew what he could do. Well, after that, my mom had a son here, who's my third sibling, and then my dad packed us up and took us to the Middle East anyways. We lived in Jordan for about six years. I was six years old when we moved to Jordan. Now, I want you to imagine a typical little six-year-old American child. I love Cheerios and Fruit Loops and some candy and milk that came from a jug. Trust me, that's not something that's all over the world. <laughs> I had to learn to love powdered milk, which was a privilege over there. And I got moved to a place that was completely different than what I had known. Not only was the food different, not only was the culture different, not only was the music different, but I no longer had a voice. I was constantly told to shut up and be quiet. I was constantly told to obey. I entered into what I call Satan's playground. And in Satan's playground, God is not king, Satan is. And that means that everybody plays by his rules. And being an American child, with a mother who's a Christian convert and also being a female doesn't grant me a whole heck of a lot of rights. It was a privilege for me to be even be breathing. Unfortunately, 
I found out that in Satan's playground, you can get molested as a child by your family. My dad's brother and my dad's uncle helped themselves to myself and to one of my sisters. When my mother protested, she got beaten and sent to live with her family's house. And then my dad's mother came out and told me that I was filthy and dirty, just like my Christian mother coming off the streets, that this doesn't happen in Muslim families. This just happens in Christian families, that her son would never do such a thing. Well, my father knew what was going on. I told him all of the details, but he didn't do anything either. It was all brushed under the rug and move on with life as usual. My mother went from living in relative freedom in the United States, where at least she didn't get hit every day, to get him beaten on a regular basis. Well, one day she decided that that was enough. She, we lived in Jordan. Now, Jordan, as, as you might know from the media, is a moderate Islamic country, <laughs> right? <laughs> It was the first day of Ramadan. Ramadan is the holy month where they do the fasting. If you ever notice, all of the attacks increase in Ramadan. Oh yeah. That's because any good deed, right? Any good deed that you do in Ramadan as a Muslim mm -hmm. is multiplied by 70 or something, mm -hmm. okay? So if you get 72 virgins outside of Ramadan, I get it 72 times 70. And, you know, my husband always says he doesn't even have time for one. So, I don't know how they're going to have time for all of that. <laughs> it was the first day of Ramadan, and I grew up in Sunni Islam. Sunni Islam makes about over 90% of Muslims worldwide. Okay? In Sunni Islam, you are not allowed to beat your wife on the face. Everywhere else is fair game. So, on the first day of Ramadan, my dad beat my mom and got on her face and her face was bloodied and bruised and she decided this is it she took herself to the mosque and she went to the sheikh and said yeah sheikh this is what my husband did to me he was outraged he told his guard go get him and if he doesn't come pull him by the ear let's pause here for a second what kind of church has that authority here in the States? No church. <clears throat> Mosques in the United States have the same authority they do in the Middle East. Just because it does not comply with the United States, they don't care. Mm -mm. So the sheikh in the Middle East has authority to get somebody to him and to put him in jail. My dad comes in. Now, the sheikh says, how could you do this to your wife? It's the first day of Ramadan. Have you no fear of Allah? My dad looks at my mom, then looks at the sheikh and goes, Yeah, sheikh, she's a Christian convert, and she cursed Allah's name on the first day of Ramadan, oh. and I lost it. The sheikh turned around to my mom and said, Go home. There's nothing I could do for you. That's justice in Islam. Well, the physical... Verbal, mental, sexual abuse went from my mother to us. Nobody was spared. And as I was learning about being a Muslim little girl, I learned quickly that really the only way to kind of save yourself somewhat is to become a good Muslim girl. Well, what does it mean to be a good Muslim girl? It means you obey, your eyes are in the ground, and you do exactly what Muhammad wants you to do. Fantastic! I'm 10 years old. Here I am being taught in Islam Salam. Islam is peace. The other part they don't tell you is that the, in the Middle East they say, um, and one day the flag of Islam will fly over the White House. That was something that was said at like dinner. Okay. Mm -hmm. And just a little tidbit in here. My dad's family, not religious at all. I grew up, none of my aunts wore the hijab. In fact, one of my aunts put up a Christmas tree. He beat her for that too. But um, they were not religious at all. They were very moderate. My grandma never wore the hijab. They went out whenever they wanted. My uncles went to the casinos. They had girlfriends. So this is what happens in a moderate westernized family. So 
I decided at 10 years old that I was going to honor my father and I was going to be a good Muslim girl. I was going to make him proud of me and he will love me. Surely he will. So what did I do? I woke up. I put on my hijab. I decided I was going to start wearing the hijab. I'm going to start doing the prayers five times a day. Mind you, I had never even seen my father open up a Quran in the house. And I was going to start learning everything about Muhammad because I want to be just like him. <clears throat> well, here's what I learned. Quran chapter 4, verse 34. And everything that I'm quoting to you, I got from Islamic websites. These are not my translations. These are 100% from Quran.com or from the Tafsir Online. <coughs> Men are in charge of women by right of what Allah has given one over the other and what they spend from their wealth. So righteous women are devoutly obedient, guarding in the husband's absence what Allah would have them guard. But those, but those from whom you fear arrogance, first advise them. Then if they per persist, forsake them in bed. And then strike them. But if they obey you, seek no means against them. Indeed, Allah has ever exalted and grand. Now the true translation of this, bless you, is... But those from whom you fear arrogance, actually it's in there, I apologize. You fear arrogance. That means that they haven't yet disobeyed you. But you think they might. You think they might be flippant with you. Beat them. And notice how it doesn't say, you know, beat them a little bit. Beat them here and there. It just says beat them. <laughs> Don't stop until they obey you. So this is where a lot of honor killing comes from. When a woman is not obedient. So I learned that everything that's been happening to my mother and to myself and my siblings is completely what is called halal. Does anybody know what halal means? Halal, you'll see it on, on meat markets if you have them here. Halal means permitted. So it's not just for food, okay? Halal food is, is, is food that was sacrificed in the way for Allah. By the way, it's gruesome. But, and it's not human at all. It's terrible. Um, and it's preyed upon and sacrificed for Allah. And it's got a face Mecca. And it's, it's a lot of legalistic stuff. It's like, come on, people are hungry. <laughs> Just let's move on. But halal is anything that Allah or Muhammad permits. And then if Allah and Muhammad haven't discussed the matter and they haven't said anything about it, then it's the fuqaha, the um, kind of like the elders in Islam, okay? The big sheikhs and the big imams. Whatever they say becomes halal, okay? Bukhari, volume seven, book 72, number 715 says, when Allah's apostle came, Aisha said, I have not seen any women suffering as much as the believing women. Look, her skin is greener than her clothes. Let me tell you a little background story on this. It's a really big hadith. So in Islam, real quick, um, there is their holy trinity, the Quran, the hadith and the seerah. The Quran, they believe, is the literal word of Allah, word for word, from his mouth. Not divinely inspired, not from the Holy Spirit. This is what Allah told Muhammad. Two is the hadith. This is everything that Muhammad said, or Aisha, apparently is in it too. Aisha is the six-year-old wife that he didn't consummate the marriage with till she was nine. That was his favorite wife. Okay, so this is a little background. Now, what happened here in this story is that this woman comes to Muhammad's house begging for help. Her, her husband had beat her till her, her skin was green. He'd obviously devastated her body. Aisha is infuriated about this. And obviously this is a norm. She says, I have not seen any women suffering as much as the believing women. Muhammad turns the woman around and sends her back to her husband. Now, why is this significant? It's because when Muslims want to come to any ruling, they have to obey the example of Muhammad. So if this, for example, happens again, and a man looks at a book, which he probably knows this by heart, but he'll look at a book and say, oh, what did Muhammad do? This mm -hmm. is what I'm going to do. Oh. I'm going to read you a little script, and then I'll go back to what I learned. 
This is actually not my book. This is my mother's book. She wrote an autobiography and it got published to her amazement. Um, and it's, it's really a fantastic book. And in the book, she calls me Sarah. And it's because she wanted to name me Sarah. On page, let's see, I'm gonna go to this page. All right. One day in 1997, this is page 244, I was sitting in shock in the passenger seat of our silver Volvo when a man tapped on my window, shaking me out of my stupor. Are you okay? Do you need any help? No, thank you, I'm okay. This isn't Jordan. I moved myself to the driver's seat and then saw that my blue jean dress was all bloodied. The blood must have dripped from my face because it felt damp. I thought my nose was bleeding. I felt a searing pain on my upper lip when I wiped it with my hand. My brain started racing to recall what had happened. That's when I heard a soft voice talking. I looked back and saw my four-year-old son, Shaddy, in the back seat. He was crumbled up in the fetal position with his arms hugging his knees and he asked, are you going to die? No, I'm okay, honey, I'm not gonna die. Although my lip hurt when I talked, I tried my best to speak in a clear voice. It took me a few minutes to reach home. The garage door was wide open, which was unusual, and I saw that somebody's truck was not there. I pulled in and parked the car, making my way to the house with Shaddy's hand in mind. In mine. The silence I experienced was unsettling, and I wanted to leave, but I saw no one around. I rushed to the washroom and soaked a washcloth to clean my face. When I glanced in the mirror, I wondered what Shaddy's initial reaction was to seeing the blood covering my face, hair, and neck. I decided I should go to the hospital before I suffered too much blood loss. I was nine weeks pregnant. I handed Shaddy an ice cream bar from the freezer. I took him with me to the hospital. This is a story that to so many people is just another battered woman, but that's my mother. And she still has a scar on her lip from that. She goes on in the book, tells you why my dad beat her that way and left her in the car unconscious when he knew full well that she was pregnant. But it is halal. The other thing I learned, Quran chapter 33, verse 59 O prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of the believers to bring down over themselves part of their garments. That is more suitable that they will be known and not abused. And ever is a law for giving and merciful. Have you guys had it in your schools yet? Where Muslims are giving out hijabs for little girls to wear? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. There are these cutesy little posters that go around and memes on Facebook that show a nun and then show a woman wearing a hijab and go, what's the difference? We should accept everybody. When a nun wears her garb, it's for modesty. It's for her own faith. When a woman in Islam wears the hijab, let me repeat it for you. That is more suitable that they will be known and not abused. It is to make sure that Muslim men can differentiate her from non-Muslim women. Well, why? So that they don't get abused. So that means that non-Muslim women can get abused. It's halal. That is why the refugees that have invaded Europe think they have a green light to take whatever they want and whoever they want and do whatever they want to them. That's why Germany can't keep track of the rapes that are happening. Pick a country, any country, the UK, it's a disaster. They actually have grooming gangs. Muslim families that are going around grooming and targeting white little girls, and now they're targeting Sikh little girls. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't heard anything about grooming, that could be a good five hours we could sit here. But basically what they do, it's sex trafficking, only the girl goes home every day. And they scare her so much and they brainwash her so much that her parents have no idea what's going on. It's terrifying. It's halal. All right?
Let me go and see it. There's seven. Okay. So the next one is Quran 2, 282. Quran 282, I don't know it by heart, but basically it says, bring from among you two witnesses. And if you don't have two male Muslim witnesses, bring from among those who you accept a witness from, one man and two women. So the testimony of a Muslim woman, of a Muslim woman, is equal to half of the testimony of a Muslim man. So... I try to give grace to my father as of recently. This is not the situation for many years. You know, if he had wanted to get justice for me, if I came out and I said in public that my uncle was abusing me and molesting me and raping me and I was no longer a virgin, and he were to say, no, she's lying, it wasn't me, then at nine, 10 years old, I would be tried as an adulteress because I have half the testimony of his. And the penalty for adultery is death. I get stoned, hung at best, or shot. That's what they call an honor killing. Sorry. Next, Quran, chapter 2, verse 216. Fighting has been enjoyed upon you while it is hateful to you, but perhaps you hate a thing and it is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and it is bad for you, and Allah knows best and you do not know. It has Who's read the Quran in here? Ever notice how Allah is really full of himself? Yeah. He thinks he's super swell. And every time he says something, he says, and Allah is merciful and mighty. And Allah is good and you just don't know. Now, the actual translation for this is not fighting. The word is qatiluhum, which is not fighting. Qatiluhum comes from the word qatil, verb qatil, which means kill. It's fight them to the death. Kill them. That is a direct command from Allah to Muslims. There's a, my favorite little verse that Hollywood and everybody else likes to, likes to quote. And they say, Allah said in the Quran, to save one soul is like to save all of humanity. They don't mention um, that the beginning of that verse says, and it has been written to the children of Israel. It has been commanded on the children of Israel to save souls. But what has been commanded on the children of Islam is completely different. And this is not just one time. This is repeated thoroughly throughout the Quran. Sorry. Let's look at the next one. This is a hadith. It's Bukhari, um, volume 9, book, not, book 83, hadith number 17, Muhammad. A Muslim who has admitted that there is no God but Allah and that I am his prophet may not be killed except for three reasons. Punishment for murder, adultery, or apostasy. Any Muslim cannot be killed but for these three reasons. So, here I was at 10 years old, finding out Islam is not peace. And that everything that's been happening to my mother, it's never going to stop. Whatever's happening to us, it's not going to stop. It's halal. Muhammad did it. His Allah is okay with it. And that my hijab that I'm wearing right now is basically to make sure that the other girls who are not wearing the hijab get raped like I did. Well, even at 10 years old, I physically got ill. I, my hair was falling out. I was getting night terrors. And I finally decided that this is not for me. <laughs> that if this is the God of the universe, I'd rather go to his hell than actually follow him. But of course, I couldn't say anything because I studied Islam. And I know that if I said anything, I'd get killed. And there's a good chance that my mother would get killed too because she's a Christian convert. So they'd look at her and say, you did this to your children. You see, in Islam, children are not really the property of their parents. They're the property of what is called the Ummah. The Ummah is the nation not the nation of Islam, the group that's here. It's the entire entirety of Muslims all over the world. Of course, then you have the Sunni Muslims and the Shia Muslims. They've been killing each other for 1,400 years. So when they can't find somebody else to kill, they just turn to each other. So, what am I to do? I took off the hijab, and like I said, I came from a really lenient family. Nobody cared. 
Nobody even ever went to the mosque except for on Eid, which is their, you know, their holidays. So I took it off and I just went with life as normal. Well, um, six years of living in Jordan, I was 12. My dad moved us to Dubai. Does anybody know what Dubai is? Where Dubai is? Yeah. It's pretty famous. Tourism. Come to Dubai. Modern Islam. Slide on the sand. Not cool. Riding a camel? Overrated. <laughs> Honestly, those things spit and puke and they're gross. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so here I am, 12 years old in Dubai, so happy. My uncle's in Jordan. I'm living my life unmolested, literally. And uh, my dad actually puts me in an English school. Super cool. Love it. Westminster. That's what it was called. And uh, I'm going around learning English and, you know, we were learning English all along, but all of our curriculum was in English. And I started to study more about England and the Revolutionary War, only from their side of the story, which by the way is not pretty. So, yeah, the treacherous Americans kept dumping our tea in Boston Harbor. But, sorry, off on a tangent. Um, so that was really nice. Except there's a much darker side to Dubai than other people would tell you. In Dubai, if you're from India or Pakistan or anywhere where you're that kind of color, you're treated as a not human being. They literally have them packed up in, in apartment buildings like little sardines. Okay? A local literally once in front of us got out of his car and pulled, the guy in front of him was Indian or Pakistani or something, pulled him out of the car, smacked him on the face, put him back in the car, and drove off. And nothing would have happened to him. Legally, the Indian, if he went and he, you know, filed a complaint, he would get deported. There is so much racism that it is so foul to even breathe in Dubai. Once you're aware of what's going on. An Australian woman a couple of years in Dubai filed a police report saying she got raped. She went to jail for years and her family was trying to get her out. It's very difficult to get her out. They did eventually. She was mortified. She said, they told me this was the tourism hot place that you could wear a bikini and do whatever you do. Oh, until they're unhappy with you. Back then, and the laws have changed since then, I believe, but back then, if you were not a local, if you're not an Emirati, somebody who's from there by blood, you cannot own property. Yeah, these are the same Muslims that come here and cry foul when somebody's eating bacon in front of them, okay? Yeah. They get super sensitive here. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is Dubai. 9-11, I was 13 years old. We were sitting down eating dinner. All of a sudden, we get a call from our cousins here in the States, and they say, turn on the TV, turn on the TV, and they're screaming. We turn on the TV, and the towers are going down. And I am watching as my dad is doing the Debka. Does anybody know what a Debka is? It's their little dance that they do in a line. Yeah, he's doing the Debka back there. My dad is doing that. He's screaming, Allahu Akbar. He's laughing. And I'm just watching. And it was devastating. It was devastating because, y'all, that was my escape plan. I was going to go back home where everything was going to be okay again. And now it's being torn apart, and I knew right away who did it. I already studied. I knew what they wanted. They told me in school. They said it on TV. They said it in the family room that they want to take over America, that they want to kill the Zionist pigs and the American infidels. That was normal. So here I am watching the towers go down. My mom is watching and she literally looks like one of those balls in that machine. What is it called when you pull it and it bounces all over the place? Ball. Yes, that's what she looks like. She's in complete panic mode. She's trying to grab all of the kids and get them out of the room. And I just sat on the couch. I fell and everything went quiet and all I could see is the rerun of the towers going down over and over and over again. 
My dad eventually walked out and went out partying with his friends and the sound finally came back. And here are the cars honking their horns. I go out to our veranda. They're all shouting Allahu Akbar, raising their green Muslim flags. They're giving out candy right in front of me. And I am just watching as these people are celebrating the death of people they don't even know. And they want to be. That's the crazy thing. That's the crazy thing. They want to wear Nike and they want to dress in jeans and they want to eat our food, but they don't want us to live. Okay? It's diabolical. It's insane. I don't even think they understand it. Islam brought so many inventions to the world. When? Please, you're the only people trying to take us back 1,400 years. Everybody else is trying to move forward. So, what do I do? I'm 13 years old, I'm outnumbered in this country, I'm outpowered. What any sane human being would do, I wore my proud to be born in the USA t-shirt. Oh. Yep, oh. right here. <laughs> and I went out to the mall. And as I was walking in the mall with my very proud, and it had a big smiley face on it, and like an American flag bandana. As I was walking, Sure as anything, I got spit on from the second level. And I look up and there's two Emiratis in their natives, right? In their white little dresses that they wear, their dashes. And they started laughing. So what do I do? I run after them. <laughs> I went up those stairs <laughs> so fast. And all I can hear in the background is my mom going, ta -da! Oh my God. And I heard some curse words, I'm not gonna lie. So I ran after them, I went upstairs to find them and there's two policemen standing there and I said, where are the guys that were just here? And they spit on me, like spit still on my head. They started laughing and said, we well, didn't see anything. Okay, one point to them, zero for me, but still lots of fierceness, okay? Lots of fierceness. John McCain said, I fell in love with my country when I was a prisoner in someone else's. Let me tell you, there's no prison like being a Muslim woman. Even worse, being the daughter of a Christian convert. I'm going to show you some pictures here. I'm going to try and enlarge them. Okay. Can you see these? That's me as a kid. Y'all go ahead and say good. Aww. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And now this is me wearing the hijab as a 15 year old. So as you can see, I'm wearing colors. Okay, my family again was very lenient and very proud. So you'd ask, Farah, why are you wearing the hijab again? Good question, thank you for asking. Let me go into that for you. I was wearing the hijab again because after 9-11 happened, my dad decided he was going to bring my uncle to live with us in Dubai. Yeah. And at that time, I tried to commit suicide. I actually had to be taken to the hospital, and they put the thing up my nose, and I was out. I was gone. And I was in a coma. And... Uh, I opened my eyes, this is what I remember. I remember opening my eyes and seeing white all around me and it was all really fuzzy. And I was like, oh gosh, okay, it's over. I did it, it's done. Can't hear anything. Slowly, my vision started coming back to me. I realized it was a ceiling. And <laughs> then my hearing started coming back. Lo and behold, my mother is sitting on my side. Let me tell you, you have not been cursed at till you've been cursed at in Arabic. It is something. Your entire ancestry goes down the drain. So here's my mom. Turns out my dad didn't want to come to the hospital. He was out partying. And uh, even though the doctor said that I should not be taken out of the hospital, he said to take me out. Now, since I'm an American citizen prior to the Obama administration, the police were notified that an American citizen had tried to commit suicide. The cop came over to me and extended a privilege I can assure you is not extended to anybody else in the Middle East. 
He said, you're an American citizen. We can take you home. We have to take you to the embassy if you ask us to take you. And you can go home. Mm. Yeah, very appealing, right? Very appealing. I really wanted to go home more than anything. But if I had gone home that day, my mother would most definitely have been killed. My sisters and my brother would have most definitely have turned into second class citizens, maybe even slaves, because they're what they would call, and I apologize for my language, but really there's nothing else other than a whore sister left to America. So I said, no, I didn't try to commit suicide. I had a toothache and I just took too much. He goes, I have your school records. You're an A plus student. You're actually working on advanced calculus. What do you mean you had a toothache? I just smiled at him and said, I'm not going. He said, okay, if anything changes, let me know. Well, something did change. I didn't let him know. One day I overheard, by overheard, I mean, my mom and dad went into the living room, closed the doors and my ear got onto the glass real close. And I overheard my dad saying that he got a visa to Canada. But he was worried that if he took us to Canada, that the children would lose their religion. So what do I do? I go and look up Canada on a map. Where's Canada? Oh, that's really close. That's where I need to go. It's frozen, but that's okay. That's where I need to go. So what do I do the next day? Got up, put my hijab on, put my black dishdash abaya on. I mean, this is like the utmost act of obedience. Started praying again, started talking about Muhammad and how great he was. My dad ate it all up. Like a baby with candy. It's fantastic. Well, then he told us, I'm thinking about taking you all to Canada. I said, Dad, that's fantastic. We could do dawah there. Dawah. It's telling people to come into Islam. It's inviting people, luring them into Islam. Mm -hmm. Right? Please don't judge me. I was 14 years old and I needed out. I would lie, cheat, steal. I would do whatever I needed to, to get out of there. So, you know, Psalms 46, 10 says, be still and know that I'm God. He's really great. What a show off. Just wait and see. <laughs> My dad still was not convinced. I still felt like he needed that little extra oomph. So I Googled Islamic schools in Canada. <laughs> Isna came up loud and clear. Islamic Society of North America. By the way, a terrorist organization. Um, Isna came up and I showed my dad with so much glee. Daddy, look at this Islamic school in Canada. Wouldn't it be great if we could go there? Y'all ever had a slot machine go ding, 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 ding. That's what he looked like. I was like, yes. So here I was, 15 years old, got to Canada. We got to Canada. My parents claimed refugee status. Oh. oh, yeah. So what was their claim? Their claim was that since my mother was a Christian, oh. that his family was persecuting her. Well, my mom wasn't lying about her refugee status. She just had the persecutor with her. And he was just simply bringing his kids in. Of course, we're U.S. citizens, so we can't claim refugee status in Canada. So they revoked our refugee status and just gave us permanent cards. But my parents, they got granted refugee status and eventually they became Canadian citizens. Well, the miraculous thing is, we took an airplane, actually, I think we drove. We drove from Dubai to Amman, to Jordan. And then from Jordan, we took an airplane to the Netherlands. Now at this point, my mom is wearing the hijab. She's been praying five times a day. She does all of her uh, fasting and everything else. We get to the Netherlands, great airport, by the way, get on a plane, mm -hmm. We're over the pond. There's blue all around us. My mom takes off her hijab. She goes, no more. Not wearing your hijab. I'm not fasting. I'm not praying. I'm not doing any of it. If I had a camera <laughs> to show you my father's face, priceless. There was nothing he could do. 
I have never seen that in him before. And it was beautiful to see my mother say, no, just like that. It's great. It's like a brand new woman I'd never met. <laughs> well, we got to Canada. I went into Isna. Sad story, y'all. I couldn't just take off my hijab like my mother did. I wasn't so brave. Got to Isna. My dad had to take me to school every day. And uh, so I finally convinced him that I should go to public school because there are not a lot of Muslims in public school. And if I'm going to do dawah, well, I should be in a public school, right? It's pretty smart. So, and he didn't want to pay Isna for their tuition anyways. Super cheap. Millionaire, but super cheap. So we go up. He goes up to the um, principal, who's Pakistani, and he tells him that he's pulling me out. The principal says, no, she's one of our best students. Why are you pulling her out? Well, the tuition, we want to put her in a public school. I'm like, yep, it's happening. It's happening. Principal looks at me. He goes, I'll give her a full scholarship. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. This guy's a bro ruined my life. I looked at my dad. I said, you know, I'd love to, but he's still going to have to take new school every day and get up early and all of that. My dad's like, yeah, you're right. We should probably just go. Show off. Right there. <laughs> That's my real father who was looking out for me. Because I could tell you, I did not see that one coming when he said, full scholarship. <laughs> well, we ended up going to public school and eventually I took off the hijab because I told my dad that the kids were bullying me because I was a Muslim. Again, a proficient liar. He said, of course, take it off and then you'll put it on, you know, when you're older and you can get married and whatnot. I was like, yes, alhamdulillah. Okay, here we go. <laughs> um, unfortunately, the abuse continued in Canada. So much so that we would go to school with apparent marks on our bodies, apparent behavior of abused children, and nobody said a word. And that is what people call cultural tolerance. Yeah. Because I can promise you that if a white child or a black child or a Hispanic child mm -hmm. showed up at school and their skin was coming off of their arm, that somebody would have been notified. Mm -hmm. But nobody said anything. Well, I was going to counseling to try and deal with my issues. And one night I was actually sleeping in the basement in our playroom. And I looked up and I said, God of Jesus, if you're real, get us out of this in one piece. You see, I'd already heard the stories of my cousins, you know, their second, third, whatever cousins who tried to get out. And then all of a sudden they go on vacation to the Middle East and nobody hears from them again. I heard about the girls that nobody even knows what happens. Oh, she ran away. What do you mean your daughter ran away? You're an Arab, you're a Muslim. You know where your daughter's at. Oh, she ran away. Allah be with her. Hmm. Hmm, she ran away? Yeah, I bet. Did she run away six feet under? The next day I told my counselor of what was going on of all of the abuse and she reported it. And children's aid came in and took us all out of the house. Well, long story short, after a lot of battles between my dad and the children's aid, my dad decided to let us have the house and he would stay away from us. But that was a lie. He came in and broke my mother's arm for having a Christmas tree in the house. Another time he came in and tried to choke her to death. The abuse continued to all of us. We had to go into high security shelters. My dad would find us every single time. How? Let me tell you how. Muslim cab drivers, yeah. Muslim counselors, Muslim teachers, Muslim police officers, their first allegiance is not to their country, it's not to their, well, it's not to their town, it's to their community, it's to the Ummah, the Ummah of Islam. And having rogue children is very damaging to the Ummah. You see, Muslim children don't belong to their parents, they belong to the Ummah. Mm -hmm. Well, we finally had to move very, very far away and start using aliases. And once my family was all settled and safe and we lost everything, everything. My dad bought our house in cash. He's very, very rich. He had taken out two mortgages on it and then filed bankruptcy and went into foreclosure. And 
you're not supposed to have mortgages. Thank you. It was a Muslim, an Islamic bank that he took money out of. And they came in, they were happy to foreclose. And my mom said, I never signed this. Oh, well, she has your name on it. There's witnesses at the bank that you signed it. Well, it's an Islamic bank, so witnesses, right? So anyways, but we were free. We lost everything off our backs, but we were free. We got out of it in one piece. And that's the truth. Once my family was all settled, I decided, well, you know, I got a full scholarship to go to McMaster University, which was an Ivy League university. And while I tried to attend the university, the fact that my dad was trying to kill me really stuck it up. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. It really put a damper on things. So I had to leave university to go into safety. Then I decided, well, where does somebody that has big dreams and wants to blend in and has nothing going for them go? California. That's where I went. In California, I tried to stand up, sign up for the National Guard. The National Guard did their tests on me and they said, oh no, we want you to learn Mandarin. I said, no, no, no. Let me explain this to you. I was 13 when 9-11 happened. I was watching it on TV and I told my mom, there's going to be a war and I want to be in it and I want to fight for my people. So you see, sir, I need you to send me to Iraq. He goes, what do you mean? People usually come in, they don't want to go to Iraq. I was like, no, I want to go to Iraq. Please send me to Iraq. He would not send me to Iraq. So I signed up as a contractor. And sure enough, 19 years old, I went to Iraq. And I was a linguist. And they told me, you were the youngest linguist who's actually an American and naturally bilingual to go to Iraq as a contractor. It's pretty cool. So at 19 years old, I was working with the JTF, and I uh, have a picture of it for you, but I'm going to read for you quickly one of my recommendation letters. And it says, the purpose of this letter is to provide my personal recommendation for Farah blank, who has performed duties as an Arabic linguist while working in TSF document exploitation docx shop in Iraq from June 2009 to October 2009. This was just the time that um, that OIC was there. I was actually there for 13 months. Um, he said, Miss Farah has a strong work ethic and is dedicated to the mission at hand. She always arrives to work on time and is always willing to perform any linguistic tasks asked of her. Miss Farah's knowledge of Arabic language and its grammar is extremely valuable to the mission. Her reading and writing skills are excellent in both languages. She excels in using the IC standard for translations of names and is extremely proficient in all aspects of translation processes. My other recommendation letter that would come in next. Oh, I think that was my mic. Change the mic. Change the batteries in that one. Okay. Well, the batteries are being changed. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. New All mic. Right. We got a new one. Thank you. I was going to start giving you a performance of Twinkle Twinkle. <laughs> it's my daughter's favorite right now. She's almost two. Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. <laughs> my next one says Farrah is my best language. Linguist. She has a strong work ethic and is dedicated to the mission at hand. She always arrives to work on time and is willing to perform all linguistic tasks assigned to her. Farah's extensive knowledge of Middle Eastern culture is extremely valuable to the mission. Her command of both the English and Arabic language make her a vital and in-demand asset. She has the ability to learn new things quickly and efficiently and works well in the office that relies on teamwork. The reason I'm reading these for you it's just a testament that I do know Arabic and English, and I do understand Islam and Middle Eastern culture very well, so much so that my TSF military peoples agreed, and they continually asked me to stay there and to extend my contract. Psalms 23.4 says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. See, I got out from Iraq. I was 21 years old. I had my 20th birthday and my 21st birthday in Iraq. Because that's just the way it said. I was there from June 2009 till July 2010. My birthday is July 22nd. 
So it just so happened that birth, both birthdays were in Iraq. And let me tell you, I love our veterans. Do we have any veterans in here? Any military peoples? Thank you. The finest group of people I had ever had the honor of knowing and working with blew my mind. So not only was a Muslim, but not only was I brought up a Muslim, I was also a liberal. Oh. 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 He who cast the first stone, okay? But here I was in Iraq, and I was surrounded in the JTF with some of the most brilliant minds that our country had. And these people were so sweet and nice and kind and smart, and I knew they were smart. And they weren't the best. And I was like, what? How could you possibly not want to feed the poor and help everybody? And... That's when the light bulbs came on, because they were willing to talk to me. And they really didn't do a whole lot of talking, they just directed me to different books. So here I was, the only person in Iraq with books coming in the mail to her. <laughs> and I was reading everything on the history of our country and all of the principles that we were built on. I was like, oh, oh snap, I was voting wrong. <laughs> so that's when I left that behind and I became a staunch libertarian. Yeah, and I was, um, I'm now a history buff. I love anything that has to do with American history. I love learning about it. My favorite president is John Adams, just so you know. Well, after leaving Iraq, um, I kind of went in a downward spiral, really is what it is. Here I was, out in the world, it was actually what had happened is um, I was engaged to a, to a guy, an American guy, and a week before the wedding, he broke it all off. Completely, he said, it's either me or your family. And I was like, buddy, I've chosen my family my entire life. Of course I'm gonna choose my family. Of course there was begging and crying on my behalf. But after that, my life really went downhill. I have to tell you something. Um, when I was 12 years old, we were in Dubai, in Middle Eastern culture, in the Middle Eastern general, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim, there's um, a very high importance placed on dreams, okay? They're very spiritual people. I mean, literally, if my grandma had a dream about something bad happening, her entire day's schedule would change. She will, she will cancel her travel plans. She will cancel weddings. It doesn't matter. If your dream tells you not to do something, you better not do it. Well, I was 12 years old, and I had a dream. I had a dream that... I was just laying down, and there's this guy's face in my face, and it was shining really bright, and it was coming out of his eyes and from behind his face, and no matter what I did to try and turn around, I could not escape the light that was coming out of him. And it was such a warm light. It's very hot even, I would say. But it felt purifying, kind of like when you have a cut and you throw some alcohol on it. You know, it's, it burns you, but you know it's good for you. It's that kind of burn that I came from. Well, what do I do? I go to my dad. I'm like, Dad, I had this dream. Now my dad looks visibly agitated. As any victim of abuse, we're very in tune with our abusers. We know when we're about to get it. And so I stood back. And he said, obviously trying to collect himself, he said, You saw Isa, Messiah. He's the prophet of the Christians, and he's a prophet of Islam. And that means that you're going to be a doctor. Mm, that's it. So I went to our books at the house that had dream explaining stuff in it. And I looked and I looked and I looked and I could not find something that said, if you see a Risa, Jesus in a dream, that means you're going to be a doctor. But I let it go because I saw how upset he was. Now, fast forward. Here I am. I'm in the States, I have my freedom, but I have too much freedom, I guess. I don't know what I do with my freedom. But out of the depression and anxiety and PTSD, and I have plenty of it, there was drinking, there was pot, there was love, there was boyfriends. And I was spiraling out of control, so much so. And I was, I was working, okay? I went to work. I was a productive 
alcoholic, as they would say. <laughs> well, one day, one of my friends, my friends came over, um, and she said, and she had a really squeaky, actually, she's from Minnesota. Okay, look at that, I forgot about her. So Amy says, Amy says, hey, Farah, um, have you ever tried cocaine? So, mm, no. She goes, well, do you want some? I considered it for a second, and I said, yeah, you know what? I don't think I want to try that. I, I think I'm okay with my drinks and the pot and the cigarettes. <laughs> she goes, well, you know what they say, you should always try everything once. <laughs> so Amy, I think they meant like bungee jumping, sushi. <laughs> I don't think crack cocaine is something you should try once. <laughs> well, that night after she left, I actually fell on my face crying and praying to God because I knew that I consider that you know yourself. We all know ourselves. And I knew that maybe next time if she asked that the answer might not be no. I said, God, please save me. I woke up the next day with a word in my brain. It said seminary. I'm like, I don't know what seminary means. So I Googled it. Turns out it's Bible school. So I called my mom and I said, Mom, I'm going to Bible. Now, at this point, my mom is an official Christian. She had been baptized. She's the one they kick out of the church because she's the last one there. And she has to say hi to everybody, and she has to pray for everybody. She's on every warrior prayer list. Um, she volunteers for everything. She wants to be Jesus' favorite. She's that one. And she said, Farah, that's, that's good, but you can't go to seminary if you drink and you smoke and you have sex outside of marriage. I said, well, why not? <laughs> she said, they won't let you. I said, what a judgmental bunch. <laughs> right? So, well, I decided that if I couldn't make it into seminary, then I am going, I actually um, emailed the pastor about it, and he said, well, why don't you come in? We'll talk about it. I said, great. He doesn't think there's anything wrong with it. <laughs> I started going to Bible studies at church. I thought, that's a good first step. Start showing up to Bible study. Y'all, I had a Harley and leather jacket, and I'm walking into Bible study on a Sunday evening, smelling like cigarettes and having just had a couple of beers. I felt great. And here I am going to learn about the Lord. Well, one of the guys that was in that Bible study, um, he didn't actually care for my opinions very much. And he didn't like my attitude towards Christianity. Well, he's my husband now. <laughs> yeah, he was real quick to correct me on things. Um, I was asked why, you know, I haven't been baptized, which I was baptized once. It was like a, I went in to visit this church and they were having a baptism thing, so I got dunked too. But it wasn't a real baptism, right? I didn't actually give my heart to the Lord. And so we were talking, and I said, you know, Jesus is a swell, great, pacifist guy, but I don't think I can be a Christian. Christians get walked all over, they're kind of like doormats, pacifists, turn the other cheek, and he goes, I don't know what Jesus you're talking about. The Jesus that I know turned tables and made whips with his hand, and he wasn't afraid to tell people when they were being <laughs> hypocrites. I said, wow, whoa, <gasps> who is that? I could follow him. That's one guy I could follow. And sure enough, I started learning about it. The funny thing is, um, my husband and I dated first time, November 1st in 2014. Well, this is completely unplanned. November 1st of 2015, I asked the Lord into my heart, completely knowing everything about Jesus. Well everything that I could possibly learn at that point. I thought I knew. Here I am. I called my mom, and I said, Mom, I gave my heart to the Lord. This is afterwards, days afterwards. And my mom didn't say anything. Now, I'm the last one of my siblings to do so. So I know my mom's been praying for this. because She's not, you know, shy about telling me that she's praying for things. But I expected, like, a zavruta. Do you know what zavruta is? It's like a li 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 type of thing. But I heard her kind of quivering on the phone. I said, Mom, what, what's going on? She goes, oh, honey, November 1st of 1992, I think it was, 
that's when I stood in the mosque and I denied Christ three times. So you're, you're my oldest daughter. So you asking Christ to your heart on that same day completes my redemption. And it completes my story. Yeah, me too. Trust me, I started bawling my eyes out. I hung up with her first because I don't want her to know I cry. But let me show you this very quickly. Because this is how the Lord has worked into my life. Honestly, I, I used to make a sailor blush. I am not that person anymore. <laughs> it is really miraculous. I can tell you what has happened in my life. But let me see if I can put this up here so you guys can see. You see this? Yeah. That's my daughter. <laughs> Okay, so we just go to a regular Baptist church. Nobody dances like that in our church. <laughs> I certainly don't. And for the people that can't see it, it is on my Facebook page. And my daughter is doing this. In this video, she was a year and a half. She is... <laughs> and y'all, even when I get excited in church, like when I feel the spirit in me, I'm like the windshield wiper Christian, like this. <laughs> right? So she certainly didn't learn it from me. But it's incredible. Because uh, I had actually gone to three different doctors in two different states. Because my husband and I really wanted children. And they said, you have too much scar tissue from the rape and molestation that happened as a child. It's not going to happen. Plus your uterus is like doing jumping jacks or is upside down. or I don't know what they said. Pretty much after they say you can't have kids, I just go blank. So we were looking at adoption, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, I was pregnant. This is incredible. It's amazing. So you said I was a high-risk pregnancy because of what my body was. Well, it turns out I'm a high-risk pregnancy also because I found out a week after I found out that I was pregnant that I have Lyme, chronic Lyme, and they couldn't treat me for it because I was pregnant. I mean, they offered, you get treated, but you can't keep the baby. So we chose to, of course, keep our Anna, who was named Anna because it means grace. Yeah. And grace saved mommy's life and daddy's. Mm -hmm. So we kept Anna, and miracle of all miracles, I had to go in to the doctor so many times because of the high-risk pregnancy. She came out beautiful, healthy, perfect, <clears throat> ten toes, ten fingers, black hair, thick as can be, the heartburn, y'all. Mm -hmm. A beautiful little baby. But when I was pregnant with her, I kid you not, I have videos of it. I was pregnant with her at seven months and eight months and nine months pregnant with her. I'd be at church, and when the worship music would start, I, her dad would see her foot come out. She would turn and turn and turn and kick. And I would just tell my husband, I'd just cry. Of course, you know, there's the hormones. But it is amazing to me that my family. That my mother abandoned Christ and that Christ found me and that my baby was worshiping Christ in the womb. Call me crazy, but that's the story I'm sticking to. <laughs> and here she is a year and a half years old. And, and ever since she started walking, she's up and she's worshiping and she's dancing and trending now in our home. Twinkle, twinkle. Holy, holy, holy. And hallelujah. <laughs> And it doesn't sound good when I sing the Hallelujah Chorus, okay? So that's my story. My story is really a story of God showing off, saving somebody who was born into slavery, bringing her out of it, and saying, go, tell people your story. Because five days after I got saved, I made this little video that I posted up to Facebook had a hundred friends. I don't even think I've had a hundred friends. And I was talking about Muhammad and what he did. And I'm sure some of you have seen the video where I said that Muhammad was a thief and a liar and he was an adulterer and he was a murderer. And it went viral. And I looked the next morning and my phone was having seizures. And I was like, what's going on? Well, I was getting calls from everybody because the video had gone viral. And I said, God, this can't go viral. My dad's trying to kill me. I'm literally in hiding. 
he said, go and tell them your story and tell them what I've done in your life. And yes, you can call me schizophrenic, it's okay. I do believe I hear from God. And I said, um, excuse me, Dad, I'm new to this, I'm a new believer. just want to remind you that my dad's trying to kill me. I said, go and tell them your story. So whenever I am asked to come and share my testimony, I do so, even if it's in freezing Minnesota. <laughs> so here's the thing. That's the end of my testimony, but it's not the end of my story. God is doing incredible things. In July, I officially have my own ministry after kicking and screaming and holding on to everything and saying, no, I don't want one, and it's called Free the Captive. And it's a Luke 418 ministry. And this ministry, <laughs> funny as ever, is actually dedicated to helping Muslims get out of Islam. That's what I want. You see, if you had asked me two years ago, three years ago, I'd have told you, I don't care if they burn. Nuke them. I've said that. Nuke them all. And now, let's save them. And let's save ourselves. And let's save our communities. Because there's nothing better than experiencing freedom after you've been a slave. And trust me, Islam makes you a slave. That's the end of my testimony. But if you guys want to come back in about 10 minutes, I'm going to be giving you verses out of the Quran and the Hadith. There's going to be three things I'm going to do. We're going to compare Islam and Christianity. Even if you're not a Christian, it is so important to listen to this. This is why. Because you will always have that one guy who thinks he's a philosopher and says, all religions are the same. <laughs> okay? The next thing I'm going to do is we're going to talk about Islam and the United States. Why is Islam incompatible, completely incompatible in the United States? Why is it in fact criminal in the United States? And we're also going to look at some examples of what's been going on here. So thank you so much for listening, and thank you for being here. I'll see you next time. Oh, thank you, sir. Are you Wes? <laughs>